GI is not that difficult. Really. <laughs> So in today's episode, we are going to talk about geographical investigation, also known as GI. And um, I'm going to focus on a couple of things such as how to properly study and revise for GI, what are some of the common pitfalls, as well as some teacher tips on how to better improve your answers for GI. Alright, so um, core geography students, you will realize that um, your GI is based on coast as well as tourism, uh, whereas for elective geography students, you will realize that your GI is based on on weather and climate as well as tourism. So since tourism is the commonality between the two, what we're going to do is we're going to focus more on tourism in this video and um, hopefully I will create some other short clips to talk more about coast as well as weather and climate. Alright, so without further ado, let's get straight into the point. Alright, so if you're watching this video, I would assume that you're someone who's either struggling with GI or you are trying to find ways to improve on your answers for GI. Okay, so um, what you can see behind me is actually the entire process of GI, starting from the pre field work phase all the way to the post field work phase. I need all of you to recognize that this whole process is actually very important and it's applicable for all the different scenarios of GI. So what I mean by scenarios are basically um, the different context of GI. So for instance, for tourism, you can apply this whole process when you're doing visitor count. You can apply this whole process if you're doing a questionnaire or a bipolar survey or you're developing a, a visitor profile. So always remember, consider these processes um, and then the little things to consider and take note of, please keep that in mind. Okay, so now, first pre field work phase. Um, now you'll realize that um, First of all, it's important to identify the aim of the GI, which is basically understanding what the students are trying to investigate. Um, now, in your exam questions, the aim of GI usually stated out at the first part of um, the question itself. They'll provide you the context. And sometimes you will also realize that midway through, uh, they will say something like, uh, the students decided to extend their investigation by finding out. So this is actually an indication that there's a change in the aim of the GI. And sometimes they might even add this. At the last part, they'll say, the students wanted to further extend the investigation by examining and then whatever that follows is actually the third set of uh, the aim of GI. So um, within a 25 marks GI question, you can have a total of three different aims. So very important to look out for it and to, I would tell my students to underline it so that you know that your answers are actually addressing the aim. In the pre-field phase, you have to identify the guiding question or the hypothesis. Um, sometimes it's stated in the question, sometimes it's a one mark question where you're supposed to write it out on your own. Um, so it's actually quite easy. All you have to do is to identify the variables and then you just craft it in the form of a question or a statement to be tested. So basically, you just need to make sure that you show that the variables have some form of relationship. So for instance, a very simple one would be um, if the two variables uh, length of stay in Singapore and the uh, distance of the country of origin. So if I want to craft a guiding question, I would say how does the distance of the country of origin affect the length of stay of tourists in Singapore? So this is a guiding question. Or if I want to phrase it in the form of a hypothesis, uh, it would be the further the distance of the country of origin, uh, the longer the length of stay uh, of the tourist. So. Um, it is actually quite straightforward, so make sure if you get a question like that, don't lose out on the one mark. Alright, so now, during the pre-field work phase, here are the things to consider. First of all, ask yourself if there is a need for secondary data. Uh, what I mean by secondary data is that um, information that cannot be gathered on the site itself. So for instance, if you are doing a traffic count, Right, secondary data it's important in this case because you got to research about the site of investigation on the day where you're heading down to collect your data. Is there, let's say, an event that's going on that will affect the traffic flow? If the day of uh, my data collection there happens to be an event that's going on there, and when I do my traffic count, this will actually cause my data to be inaccurate. So my data will now be an anomaly in this case. So just be mindful of that. So other forms 
terms of secondary data can include weather forecast or information about let's say uh, the number of hotels in the region uh, or looking at maps to identify where all the different uh, transportation facilities are you know all this uh, that you cannot really identify or get on site itself but have to be done prior to the investigation and usually through online medium or through um, other forms of research like looking at brochures pamphlets etc um, the next thing to consider would be the suitability of the site, the date and the time of investigation. I think this is dependent on the context itself. And of course, next thing would be recording sheets. Um, now, recording sheets for tourism will come in the form of questionnaire, bipolar survey, a land use survey map or sometimes it can simply just be a table especially if you're doing traffic count. So um, you might get questions that ask you to describe recording sheets. So in this case, uh, be very precise. If you are describing a table, then you got to tell me what are each column and row going to represent and then how you're going to input the data. So for instance, if you are doing traffic count, the best way is to use tally method, right? Every stroke will represent every individual who has walked past. Um, and then next, um, take note of the data collection instruments. Now this is especially useful for coast as well as weather and climate GI. Uh, coast GI for core job students, uh, you will realize that the instruments may include things like, let's say if you're doing um, a longshore drift, you will need to know wind direction, wind speed. So you have to use wind vane anemometer and then measuring tape and then um, ranging poles and then uh, stopwatch. So things like that, they are all instruments that are crucial that has to be prepared before you actually head out to the site itself. And then for students doing weather and climate, you will realize that you will need instruments like same thing, wind vane, uh, anemometer. Um, you might also need things like, let's say, rain gauge, sling psychrometer. All those are instruments that are useful to help you collect the weather data. Okay? So I realize I have been talking non-stop. So if I'm going a little bit too fast, do feel free to just pause the video, trying to internalize whatever I've just said and um, try to use it to apply it to the context that you're studying. So now let's move on to the field work phase where we're looking at how the students collect the data and other things to consider when they're on site itself. So first of all, they should look at location. What do I mean by location? Now you have already decided on the site of investigation. Now, as a group of students uh, at the site, you need to decide on how you're going to distribute yourself, where you're going to station yourselves. So in the context of Tourism GI, the most important thing is to recognize that if I'm doing bipolar survey or questionnaire, then it would be ideal that uh, we all scatter ourselves throughout the entire site so that we can have a better coverage. But if I'm doing traffic count, then the more practical thing to do is to station myself at the entrance or the exit so that I can prevent myself from double counting. Okay, so um, de determining where to station yourself is something that's important that you have to consider on site itself. And then next one would be sampling methods. So there are three types of sampling methods. We have random, systematic, and stratified. So for random sampling method, uh, very important, it is not just going out to the streets and randomly just grab someone and say, I'm going to interview you. Uh, but instead, what you should do is to get a random number generator or you roll a die and then basically you generate a series of numbers and you will interview people based on these numbers. Okay, and then the next thing would be systematic sampling which is quite straightforward basically you have a fixed interval so for instance I'm going to interview every fifth person who walk past and then uh, stratified sampling method um, basically it allows you to have equal proportion uh, of uh, interviewees from the criteria that you have set so for instance um, gender um, I'm going to have 50 male respondents and 50 female respondents or I can have 50 tourists and 50 visitors and 50 50 locals uh, to uh, answer my questionnaire and that's for stratified sampling okay so next we have sample size so sampling size itself um, it's important to ensure that it's not too small uh, ideally more than 50 so that you can ensure that the data is more reliable 
and then uh, for duration of data collection and time interval it's important to note that uh, this is particularly useful for investigations such as uh, traffic count because how long are you gonna uh, count the traffic for so um, I would say uh, more than 15 minutes and then the time interval would be one hour so I will collect the traffic count the number of people for 15 minutes at one hour interval each so that this can ensure that the data is more reliable as well okay and then data collection methodology so usually the way they phrase the question would be outline the steps that the students can take to obtain the data uh, that's presented in table one or figure one for instance so um, common mistake that I notice students tend to make would be they would just regurgitate everything that they have memorized from the textbook or from their notes and um, without making specific reference uh, to the to the table or to the figure that's provided to them. So recently I said a question about longshore drift and I said that uh, the distance traveled by the orange for two minutes and I gave one column and of course there are other columns and then um, students because in their notes it was uh, observation of the orange for 10 minutes so in their answer they said that oh the students would then use a stopwatch and time for 10 minutes and observe the movement of the orange so this tells the marker that you are not really picking out evidence from the figure or from the table that's provided so very important to first analyze the table or the figure and um, adjust your answers based on whatever evidence that has been provided okay and then next thing would be that um, data collection through observation uh, one common mistake that we notice students tend to make would be they assume that data collection is merely just statistics right uh, but uh, they often forget that um, photographs as well as field sketch can be forms of data collection because uh, they can be used to help to increase the validity of the conclusion that they draw at the end of the GI all right so now let's move on to the post Few phase where we're gonna look at data presentation as well as drawing conclusions and how do you improve on the investigation so now let's look at data presentation um, now there are multiple ways to present data but the most common type would be uh, the graphical presentation methods such as line graphs bar graphs uh, pie charts scatter graphs so uh, do you know when to use which graph Okay, that's the common question that I get from students. Um, I would always say it's actually quite straightforward. Basically, if you want to present data that's continuous, so if it's time-dependent kind of data, it's always a line graph. If not, um, if it's categorical kind of data, it would either be a bar graph or a pie chart. Okay, um, now, line graph... Um, basically the x-axis will always be time related it can be the hours it can be the days of the month it can be the months itself or it can be the years so as long as you get data that changes with time it will be a line graph but common mistake would be you got to be precise with uh, which type of line graph because there is a simple line graph there's also comparative line graphs so if it's comparative line graphs it means that you have more than two variables so you have more than two lines so in your description you got to first tell me that the students will present the data in the form of a comparative line graph that's one mark okay and then you got to tell me what does the x and y axis represent and then um, if you are presenting the data right in a comparative line graph each line will actually represent something you got to write that in your description as well so um, that's basically how you describe the use of a line graph and for bar graphs same thing you got to tell me whether it is a simple bar graph or is it a comparative bar graph next would be pie chart if you are doing a presentation of data to show proportion pie chart would be useful but please be mindful that the actual stats itself you have to convert it to percentage and then you have to convert it to the angles so that you can actually draw the pie chart itself yeah okay so next would be scatter graph scatter graph would be to show relationship because you have to draw a line of best fit and the line of best fit would basically show you whether the relationship is actually a positive or a negative one and then maps can also be a form of data presentation especially if you are showing distribution of um, let's say hotels within the resort something like that 
Okay, and next one would be annotated field sketch and annotated photographs. Like I said before, this is actually something that's very useful if you want to enhance the validity of your conclusions. So um, do consider writing that down your answer, especially if you're doing things like bipolar survey. Uh, it's environmental perception, right? Or cultural perception. So um, using annotated photographs or annotated field sketch, you can help to enhance the validity or reliability of the data okay and then drawing conclusions from data basically this kind of questions are common as well um, when it comes to drawing of conclusions of the data please be mindful that uh, depending on how the question is being phrased if they say draw conclusions ideally you need to make sure that you have your first main conclusion you support with statistics and then you can also draw another conclusion based on anomalies and then of course support with statistics as well all right, and then improvements of GI, usually this will come in the form of increasing the reliability or accuracy of data and there is actually a difference between reliability and accuracy. So um, now in the case of uh, tourism GI, reliability would be things like repeating your investigation uh, multiple times within a day or repeat your investigation over a span of a month and um, or you can repeat your investigation and on other sites and you uh, compare it. So all this are um, basically related to reliability. But for accuracy, it would be more of, let's say, questionnaire. If your questions are phrased with a lot of geographical terms that your respondents are not able to understand easily, then this will affect the accuracy of the data. And accuracy has also got to do with um, the way you use your instrument for instance if there's a parallax error you know this is actually uh, going to affect the accuracy of the data as well all right so um, do be mindful um, of uh, what are the possible uh, ways to improve accuracy and reliability for different gi contexts Next, we're going to look at secondary data to cross-check uh, your conclusion and to, to increase the validity of your conclusion. Uh, I know I've mentioned secondary data at the start, but um, after you've completed the entire GI, at the very end, it's good to um, reconsider if there is a need for secondary data such as uh, tourist count uh, from the local official websites, things like that, to further enhance your uh, conclusion to see if it's actually um, on the same page as your conclusion that you have drawn so it's good to consider about that as well and you can actually write that in your answer and most of the students actually don't think about this so yeah that's something for all of us to take note of so now that i've covered the entire process of gi from the pre field phase all the way to the post field phase i hope there's some takeaway and um, i hope this is useful for all of you um, and most important thing is that um, you will realize that gi itself there's so many different possible scenarios uh, but what is common is that the process from pre to post field the things to consider are always the same so um, when you're doing revision, I would rather you um, study case by case. So that means today, I'm, if I'm a core job student, I'm going to look at uh, the uh, investigation of longshore drift. And then I'm going to go through this process. And then tomorrow, I'm going to study about uh, sediment size sorting. And I'm going to go through this entire process. I'm going to do the same for every single possible scenario. And do the same for tourism GI as well. And you will realize that when you have finished doing that, and when you look at an actual GI exam question, it will make more sense and the answers can come easily. All right? So make full use of GI because actually GI it's about one quarter of your entire paper. It is exactly one quarter for core job. It's about a quarter for elective geography. So um, yeah, you realize that there's not a lot of content, but your answers are actually based on the context that's provided in the question itself. So as long as you're familiar with this process, you should be able to do well for it. Okay, so if you have any questions after watching this video, do feel free to just drop me a DM or comment below and I'll see how I can help. Alright, all the best for your revision and we'll see each other again soon. Yeah, soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>